Here we have Lightwave 2018's new material, the Principled Shader, or Principled BSDF. This shader, this material, is a wonderful new multifunctional material that is cut wonderfully for the new PBR system. It's intended to be quick, easy to use, pick up an awful lot of the heavy lifting for us automatically to ensure that our surfaces come out right and generally just be a wonderful catch-all, do-all shader for the vast majority of circumstances. It is based on Disney's development of their principled physically based shader. You might find it helpful to go and have a little peek at Disney's paper on this whole thing so that you can see how they went about putting it together and what the aims were. Long story short, they just went through and did an awful lot of close-up examinations of real-world materials, all types of things, fabrics, woods, plastics, metals, glass, you name it, figured out all of the response functions that these different types of materials exhibit, and then came up with a singular shader that could replicate all of these different effects, mixing them together in a physically accurate manner, with the aim being that you get a simple material that is very artist-friendly to use. This was extended a few years later by the introduction of subsurface scattering, taking it from a BRDF to a BSDF. And again, you can look at Disney's presentation on some of the advancements that they made and how they used it in their pictures and their renderers in this document here. It's from this that the title of the shader comes, Principled. Basically, what the shader is intended to do is to follow the physical principles, which apply in the real world to real materials. That said, it is intended to be quick, easy to use, and artist-friendly, so it does simplify certain things. As such, you should regard it as a physically principled material, drawing on physical principles, rather than a truly physically accurate in every sense material. There are little shortcuts and clever cheats in the algorithm. As such, while I say that it is a, you know, catch-all, do-all material, it's more of a catch-all, do-all material for 90% of every surface you're ever going to need to render. For certain materials that have very detailed characteristics that you absolutely want to nail, then the ease of use of this material can start to get a little bit in the way of its flexibility. That, of course, is one of the reasons why in Lightwave we still have these other materials, Delta, Dielectric, Skin, Sigma, and so on. So whilst Principled is a wonderful material and it will save you an awful lot of time and effort in the vast majority of circumstances, do be aware that if you do come across, you know, very fine detailed materials that you need to nail a specific look for, it is still worth going to Lightwave's other materials. We do have them for a reason. So with that said, let's take a look at the basics of using it. First of all, I want to show you how certain elements are dealt with in this very automatic way because the material is very automatic. It doesn't really let you violate the physical principles. For instance, let's just slap a little red color on our guy here. Okay, we can see that we've got some specularity in him. Let's just turn that off momentarily, shall we? Now, let's remember what we said back in the foundations about how materials sort of break down into two characters of conductors or insulators, or metals and non-metals. One of the things you'll notice here that we've got is this metallic option, right? If we turn that up, then what do we get? Well, we see that we get this, you know, metallic foil-like material, and oh look, it's reflective, it's got specular, but my specular control was it zero? Why am I getting specular? My specular setting doesn't seem to be doing anything anymore. Why is that? Well, of course, remember what we said about conductor or metallic materials? They have no diffuse. They only have specular. Thus, the metallic setting overrides the specular setting. At least it does when it's at 100%. If we were to say something like 50% metallic, then we've still got this sort of metallic reflection look, only it's a little bit softer. But now, of course, we've got 
additional specular control on top of that, which would be our insulator style or dielectric style specular. Notice, of course, that even though I've got these guys turned up, look, 50% plus 81%, surely that violates energy conservation. No, it doesn't, because the material is handling all of that for us in the background. And this comes into play in other places. So let's turn my metallic down to zero. OK, let's put my specular at 100% here. We'll notice that I still have diffuse colour. Why? Well, because, of course, the material contains Fresnel. So we're getting strong speculars on the glancing angles here, where, as you can see, we've lost all red. We're getting 100% reflection there. But, of course, on the facing parts to us, we're still able to see some of the diffuse. If I take my transparency, and let's put that up to 100%. Then once again, you know, you see that my specular reflection, at least on the front face areas here, is pretty much gone. I'm only getting it at the glancing angles. Again, the material is doing all of the conservation work for us. What happens if I turn up metallic? Well, I go back up to 100% metallic. Now my transparency has completely gone. Why? Well, you don't get transparent metals. So things like that can make this shader seem a little weird when you first start using it because settings seem to override one another. But to a large extent, that is the point of this shader, to be artist friendly. You can't violate energy conservation. You can't muck up the Fresnel effect. This is why, back in Foundations, I said a good way to start thinking about your materials is in terms of this conductor insulator divide. If you're trying to do, you know, a wood or a plastic or a glass, fabric, ceramic, anything like that, clearly these are not metals. So leave your metallic option alone. If you're trying to do steel or chrome or foil, aluminium, tin, and so on, clearly these are metals. So you would turn up your metal setting, and then it really ceases to matter what you're doing elsewhere with things like, you know, specular and specular tin, because that's not part of the metallic model. Coming from earlier versions of Lightwave, of course, we've thought of things in terms of diffuse and specular and so on and so forth. This is a different kind of workflow. We're trying to think about not what the traditional properties we've associated with materials are. We're trying instead to think about what the material actually is. Hold it in your hand. Oh, that's wood. When you think about it, it's actually a much more simplistic and intuitive way of working than the old one was. Of course, at this point, some of you might regard the fact that we're also getting awfully close to the ways that we've seen PBR done in things like Substance Painter. A lot of folks now like to create their materials and textures in Substance Painter, and of course you output your UV maps of those textures. To that end, a few folks have gotten a bit confused about exactly how you take the Substance workflow and bring it into Lightwave using the principled shader, because this seems like the obvious choice for it. Because Substance has two ways of working. It either has a specular and gloss output, where you get a specularity and glossiness map, or it has a metallic and roughness output, where you get a texture map for metallic and another for the roughness. Which of these should you use? Well, again, our principled material isn't a Substance material. It is the Disney model. And thus, we really have three things in play for this. We have a roughness, a specular, and a metallic. We said in substance that there's the, you know, the roughness or the glossiness. Obviously, these two things are just the opposite of each other, right? A roughness map is where a surface is rough. A glossy map is a map of where it's not. As such, if you want to bring textures from Substance Painter into Lightwave, the best thing to do is to output two sets of maps, output the metal and roughness and the speck and gloss, then you can bin off the gloss and you just use the specular, the roughness and the metal maps. And those will plug straight into the principled shader and work great, as well as, of course, obviously the color map. Otherwise, the best idea is to go for the metallic roughness workflow in Substance Painter. And from these maps, you can normally fiddle around in nodes to combine them, add, subtract in order to create a specular map. And we'll see details of doing that later on in the projects section when we get ready textured models. And we've got some maps, but we don't have others. And so we have to sort of invent them in the node editor. But for now, let's continue on and take a look over all of the settings that we've got here in the principled material. So 
Some of this obviously speaks pretty well for itself, right? We've got specular, which makes it reflective or not reflective. You can dial that up and down. And obviously that is for the insulator or dielectric style specular effect. We have roughness, so when that's at 0% or very low, then we get these very sharp, glossy reflections on things. And of course, as we go up to higher and higher values, then our specular reflections become roughened or they become much softer. You see how we go through the roughness there? Very shiny, we get this sort of plastic-like look. But as I pump up the roughness here, look, we're starting to get a much more almost rubber sort of look. We have specular tint. This will, of course, tint the color of our specular highlight. Again, with soft reflections like this, with rough reflections, it sort of enhances this rubberiness. And of course, when we're at more glossy reflections and we turn up the specular tint, then we start to get more into this hard plastic type look. Of course, the tint to the specular is tinting it with the diffuse color. Sheen is sort of a bit like a slight added specular. It's very soft, very subtle. You can just about notice it on the edges of things. This is easier if we pop over to the sheen buffer itself and we can see that we just get this very light and of course soft style reflection. The sheen isn't really affected much by our roughness other than its creep over the surface. It doesn't give us these sharp reflections. Most commonly you would use sheen on things like fabric. You also notice that whilst the spinner will stop at 100%, sheen is actually one of those things that can be overdriven. So you can type in values over 100% and get additional sheen coming through. That of course starts to make it more noticeable there. There, you see how it creates this sort of, you know, almost additional roughness appearance, but in the diffuse more than the idea of specular. Great little add-on for fabrics. Also, again, certain types of rubber, rough, unpolished ceramics. They can also do nicely with some sheen. Of course, just like the specular, the sheen can be tinted, thus starting to pick up elements of the diffuse color there. Of course, due to Fresnel effect, diffuse drops off at the glancing angles, as we should recall. So, of course, what you see you can also do with the sheen and sheen tint is to essentially give yourself this diffuse boost. Sheen can also be a good thing to add onto wood type surfaces, particularly rough, unpolished, unvarnished woods. And we see here that I'm actually using the alpha of the wood texture to drive the sheen result itself so of course that means that you can get things such as the sheen being driven by the grain itself so of course where you've got these little deep furrows in the grain you don't get the sheen effect and of course where it is smoother on the rings then the sheen appears translucency right this is an interesting little effect and you'll see that if we crank it up to 100 percent here uh, nothing seems to change what's going on. Okay, translucency only applies when we have thin checked. And if we check that, then we see that, well, we get something, but it's hard to say that it's really translucent. I mean, you look at the underside of his, his hat, here, his helmet, I should say. Um, and frankly, it just looks a little bit weird. You can see that it has had a certain effect. It's sort of increased the contrast of the diffuse shading somewhat. And as such, you know, it can come in useful. But the truth is that this is supposed to be used with thin surfaces. And when I say thin, I mean one polygon. It's the same as the translucency pretty much in the standard material. So we get just a single flat plane here, nice simple flat plane object. We'll turn thin on for it and let's put the translucency up to 100%. As you see, in keeping with PBR, some light is going through it and so it appears to get darker. Obviously, light is going through so it can't be reflected back as diffuse. We're not seeing anything through it though. I can't see our, our statue there, but it's really for light translucency. So let's get ourselves, how about a spherical light? Just make that guy a little bit smaller and let's just pop it up here 
behind our plane and perhaps it doesn't need to be quite so bright and there we can see it as it's nice and close to the plane then we see the light coming through there quite strongly and of course as it moves further away then its effect is dimmer. So again just like in standard this translucency is good for surfaces such as lampshades, very thin curtains, elements of that nature where you want light to be able to be seen through something. Let's also note that it's usually good with such surfaces to have them double-sided that will show us that the translucency does indeed work whichever side of the surface our light is on. Of course that generally can be quite important because if we're going to perhaps have an animated camera then we'd want to see you know or we'd expect that we might see our surface from multiple angles during the shot or of course our lampshade might be you know caught in the reflection of something else you would want to be able to see its rear side not just be magically transparent so double-sided thin translucency for thin stuff we can also notice if I cast a bit of distant light there that translucency on a thin plane like this will also pick up shadows from behind however notice what is having no effect here which is my roughness setting that's not giving me you know a blurred translucent shadow the shadow is fully sharp that is of course entirely dependent upon my light and whether the shadow it is casting is soft or not as such you might find for instance if you've got you know a character that's being seen behind a shower curtain or something you're wanting a soft shadow but your lighting perhaps doesn't have soft shadows or whatnot and you're not wanting this sort of harsh projection of shadow it's one of those cases where you'll set up multiple lights and what you will do is use their exclusion properties to you know get a soft shadowed lighting onto your translucent plane and then your regular lighting on your other objects and do stuff like that however whilst we are on the subject of this whole translucent thing notice one thing that you can do with even thin double-sided you know single polygon planes like this is you can actually get transparency going on them like this you can make them partially transparent and as you see the roughness still doesn't appear to be having any effect on us here but that's because of the refraction index which at the minute is set to one so there's no refraction hard to judge because of course it is a thin plane but if you put this up to something like say 1.3 then you see we don't get the back cast shadow but we do get this sort of you know bleed through translucent appearance like this we can even do something low like a 1.1 refraction index so there's not much bending of the light and just turn the roughness up an awful lot and also get these nice soft show through effects which can be handy for thin type surfaces as well let's also not forget our ability to do things like material mixing so we could set up another principled shader here that's using the thin mode like this and plug that and our transparent one into material mixer and use that as our material and then of course blend off between them a little and that will allow us to create effects of this sort and of course not forgetting the whole thing about shadow angle for the softness of shadow show through so whilst these thin surface effects can be a little bit tricky we do see that we have a couple of options and with a little bit of wrangling we can get some nice and subtle effects from it so moving on the flatness setting this is just a small tweak or you know attenuation to the diffuse response we take a look at it with zero flatness here and we'll turn that up to 100 and as we can see the difference is very subtle indeed there it is at 10,000 and you can see that it's a bit more pronounced the effect again it's one of those few little things that can be overramped. and as you really see it just sort of tweaks how soft the diffuse appearance is again this is like sheen it's a good setting 
for those very soft sort of surfaces things like you know wood and fabric things that have a certain softness in their diffuse response to light otherwise a very subtle effect we then come on to of course translucent type behavior in solid objects rather than thin ones and of course the first for that is subsurface scattering very simple little subsurface allowance here so we just you know dial up a percentage of how much subsurfacey-ness we're getting and of course we have a subsurface color very often this might be the same as the main surface color or at least close to it but not always it can indeed be quite different and of course we have a distance the higher the distance then the softer the effect so we can see here i mean this statuette is about what 100 millimeters or so tall and with a one meter subsurface distance we can see that it's coming out very very soft indeed an awful lot of that you know detailed shading is being lost perhaps for something like this would normally be about 30 millimeters and there we go we can start to see a much more clearly understandable effect getting a sort of a translucent plastic type of appearance that'll be helped if we add a bit of specular onto it of course so we're getting a you know plasticky type reflection off of the surface of course it's still quite deep for the thickness of parts of this model as i say it's only a hundred odd millimeters tall and so we're getting a lot of the subsurface color and much less of the main diffuse color so of course where we're seeing the blue here obviously the light is off in this corner pointing down we can see that from the shadow then this of course is the forward scattering that we're seeing whereas the diffuse color is much more what we would call the back scattering color we take this down again let's say 10 millimeters then we can see of course everything is starting to sharpen up a little bit there and what we see is that the red is still not that heavily pronounced we're still getting a lot of forward scatter not so much back scatter and that's really what our subsurface percentage is when we go right up to 100 percent then it's all forward scattering none of the back scattering another way to think about this in terms of the energy conservation is that all of the light is penetrating through the surface nothing is being reflected back at least not by the diffuse and as we come down to lower percentages then we're getting much more of the backward scattering so you know diffuse style return of the light and much less of the forward scattering so we only start to see that on the absolute thinnest parts there like this it's pretty quick to render the subsurface scattering of the principal shader at least compared with the other offerings and for the most part we would use it on non-organic things that are subsurfacey, so translucent plastics stuff of that nature you can do a skin with it we get ourselves an approximate caucasian skin tone here for the for the main color and for the subsurface color we'll go over to you know a a deeper red give it some roughness so it's not too shiny perhaps we'll make that red a little deeper turn up the subsurface a little bit so we're getting more of that shine through and there you go we start to get a pretty nice subsurface effect there that looks quite soft and pretty now how good it is as a realistic you know truly photorealistic human skin shader is a bit debatable here we're just using flat color if of course you had a realistic head with realistic textures that would go a long way to making it look much more realistic but the subsurface effect itself is of course a simpler principled version what you will find that this works great on though is if you're doing cartoon characters that sort of toonish subsurface scattering that you do see on disney characters and pixar characters the shader here for that works wonderfully so what else do we have luminosity well that's pretty obvious isn't it you know you turn on luminosity and the surface emits light seen like this of course it just appears to get brighter but of course you would also see that in reflections and of course if we were using global illumination then of course the luminous value would indeed cast light into the scene and of course it doesn't use the main surface color it has its own luminous color here like this so of course 
the surface can be one colour, but it can be emitting something else. Or, of course, for some surfaces, perhaps a panel of lights or whatnot, you might have a texture map where different lights on the panel are different colours and you can just plug that texture map into the luminous colour input. Metallic, of course, this takes us between the dielectric model and the metallic model for our surface. Of course, that overrides things like our specular, transparency, subsurface. See, subsurface doesn't work with metallic on either. It just gives us a quick, easy way to get conducting type metallic surfaces. Just turn up metallic to 100% or near 100%, set your roughness as is appropriate, because of course the roughness setting works with metallic just as it does with specular so you can get very shiny metals or much softer metals and of course in this case then the specular color is just coming from the main color here obviously in metallic mode this is no longer diffuse color because metals have no diffuse if you're wanting things like steel and chrome then you'll be using a white or near white shade very light gray a very bright gray with a high roughness gives you that nice sort of unpolished aluminium type look low roughness and bright colors for of course colored foils christmas baubles that sort of thing yellow or ochre type colors if you're doing you know gold or bronze and of course oranges or browns for more coppery type surfaces of course with metallic we have an anisotropic setting with of course a rotation setting to cast the direction of the anisotropy but of course, don't forget, like an isotropy elsewhere, you need a projection fed into the shader in order for that rotation direction to make some sort of sense. Next up then, we have clear coat. This is kind of like a varnish or a lacquer on top of everything else. So if we've got a very rough surface like this, so we've got specular, but it's really, really soft and rough, we can have clear coat operating on top of that which will give us a nice shiny specular or at least will give us a shiny specular dependent upon the gloss here note that's a gloss setting not a roughness setting so here a hundred percent is shiny and zero percent is matte what this of course allows you to do is to create a mixed specular type highlight so of course you can have a roughness setting that's giving your main specular a bit of a softer appearance whilst having this clear coat on top to pick out really sharp highlights and again this can work really well on metals you will see on many types of metal in the real world where they get these really sharp bright highlights just like we're seeing on the nose here but then they sort of have this this spread this little sort of you know mix out on the sides there by mixing up clear coat and specularity on metallic surfaces you can get really good looks that come out really very realistic indeed of course that clear coat works with non-metallic surfaces as well so when we are just doing you know a dielectric type surface then we can get much the same effect we can have these mixed speculars where we have a softer main specular but we also have this bright specular that's hitting over the top or the other way around and of course don't forget when we are in dielectric mode we've still got the specular tint so we can get that sort of colored spread around our highlight as well finally then we have transparency which is again another transmissive type setting for solid objects and generally this is used for glass or clear plastics acrylic that sort of thing generally it's one of those settings even though of course you can grade it at any point you want it's normally either going to be off or it's going to be very high indeed what you will use most commonly when using transparency is very high 90 percent 100 percent you'll use the transmittance color which is the color of light that comes out the opposite side of the glass or plasticky surface so maybe that's going to be a blue or something like that and you'll tweak it with the transmittance distance so rather than mixing halfway between you know diffuse shading and transparent shading you'll normally go 100 percent transparent and what you'll be altering for the 
thickness of the glass, so to speak, is the actual transmittance distance itself. What you will sometimes find when using the transparency, it's going to vary a bit on your scene, is sometimes that these glassy objects, especially when they're sat upon a surface, can start to look a bit weird. So, I mean, you know, if we look at the actual head and the shoulders of our guy here, he's all pretty good. But look at his base, where it's sat on the ground, it almost looks, well, it looks pretty unrealistic. Don't forget the opaque checkbox that we have here, and that will give internal shadowing to the glass as well. So it actually casts a shadow inside itself. You see that that's produced no real material difference to the main part here, but the base, because of course there's going to be a shadow hitting the ground, that's treated much more realistically thanks to the opaque checkbox. Of course, you've got your refraction index for how refractive, how strongly refractive the glass is, or the plastic or whatever it happens to be is. Your specular value, of course, is largely overridden because we are going for the transparency model here. So, of course, energy conservation light that passes through or doesn't get reflected off. Of course, the roughness still applies. And in this case, the roughness gives us both softness and roughness to our specular shading, but it also does so for our refraction shading. And so, of course, that gives us rough glass or frosted glass and similar things such as that. Of course, other stuff like the clear coat still work with it. So if we're wanting to have this frosted glass that still has a nice shiny highlight, nice shiny specular to it, then of course we can always pop on some clear coat and that gives us a frosted glass that is rough internally but polished and shiny externally. What we'll also find that we can do with the old transparency is actually to mix it up with some subsurface as well because if you think about it they are both transmissive effects of light being transmitted through a surface. So perhaps we turn our subsurface up something like 75, give it a similar color, bit of distance so it's quite deeply through. Let me just turn off the transparency for a moment so I can have a look at the subsurface alone. Yeah, there we go. That's very soft and shine through, isn't it? So let's get our transparency back up. Let's try 50%. Going to tweak that transmission more into the green and we'll make the transmission distance quite high, let's say 150 millimeters there. We'll get the roughness kind of far up as well, 80%. Even throw on a bit of sheen just to help pick out the shapes a bit there. And you see that we can get this sort of mixed, transparentish, scattery sort of surface effect like this. This can be pretty good for some of those, you know, very fine, very thin, delicate porcelain type materials can also work well for scattery gel-like materials. Things like silicone gel or toothpaste or even ketchup. Things that when you smear them and they get really quite thin, they become very transparent and glassy, as we're seeing here on his shoulder area. But as soon as they build up a little bit of thickness, they become, you know, much more opaque and sort of scattery, as we can see, of course, on the main areas of his face, helmet, and of course, a bit of shine through. And so there we have it. That is the principal shader. We see the wide variety of material types that it's able to represent, how, of course, it handles all of the physicality for us and the energy conservation so we can just sort of tweak away at random and things don't get messed up. As long as we, of course, understand the certain things that it's doing under the hood, like the, you know, metallicity, counteracting, specular and diffuse, then, of course, that ceases to make it confusing when we're turning metal and can't adjust specular and we wonder what's going on there. It really is just switching us between different models and modes of operation under the hood to try and give us a physically plausible material with a reasonably simple set of different settings. All in all, pretty easy, very versatile, very artist friendly once you get used to its workflow. And as I say, it will very often be your standard go-to material for a wide variety of surface types when you're trying to texture, surface, all manner of different materials in Lightwave 2018.